Welcome, friends, to Voice of Assurance, the MP3 edition. I'm Dr. Tom Kakuza, pastor of Northland Bible Baptist Church in St. Cloud, Minnesota. The purpose of Voice of Assurance is to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ and to equip believers through verse-by-verse -verse preaching and topical message. Now, while there is no substitute for individual participation in a sound local church, I trust these messages will augment your spiritual growth and be a blessing to you. Let's go ahead now to the message. The Gospel of John, chapter 15, we have been in the upper room for some time in our study, and uh, I believe that the time in the upper room at this point is over. With the last line in uh, John, chapter 14, verse 31, Jesus said, Arise, let us go hence, which suggests that the next two chapters may have been spoken on the way to the Garden of Gethsemane. It's probably that Christ and his disciples were passing some vineyards, or perhaps the temple. They may have been passing the temple on the outside there, uh, if you know the area, the Temple Mount, because the temple had golden vine decorations on it. And uh, when he gave the analogy of the vine and branches, this could very well be what he was referring to. He was either referring to that decoration there on the temple, or else he was referring to some going through by some actual vines and branches. Now, I've got to confess something today. I'm not a good gardener. Some of you are master gardeners, and I appreciate that. And, uh, but I'm not a good gardener. But I do understand something simple about plants. If you have a healthy plant and it has leaves on it, and you were to cut a leaf off in a short time, that leaf would die. It would die. It would, it would uh, shrivel up. And uh, such is the way it is in the Christian life in a practical sense. Now, once you have salvation, you can't lose salvation. But as a Christian, you can certainly lose your vitality. You can lose your fruitfulness. And you can become a barren Christian. And you can become a shriveled up Christian. Now, nobody wants to be a shriveled up Christian, I don't think. As we get older, that's, uh, we, we start shriveling anyway. So we don't want to shrivel up. But God wants his garden, so to speak, to be healthy and thriving. God wants healthy children. He wants a healthy garden, okay? In these days when green is fashionable, all right? I'm for green, and I love green plants. And God wants us to be healthy. He does not want us to be shriveling up. Now, what Jesus says here to his disciples, I think, is very powerful. If you remember last week, he talked about he was going away. He said, but I will not leave you without a comforter. The Holy Spirit is going to come, and he is going to be your new comforter. Jesus left. He sent, he and the Father sent the Holy Spirit to be our comforter. And of course, the Holy Spirit, uh, today, when a person trusts in Jesus Christ as a Savior, the Holy Spirit comes to live within that person that very moment, and He is there forever. He is our seal. We are sealed by the Holy Spirit. We are sealed with the Holy Spirit, according to the book of Ephesians. And uh, He'll never leave us. He is the down payment of our salvation. That's one reason why once you're saved, you're saved forever, because He'll never leave. We are sealed by and with the Holy Spirit. But what we have in John chapter 15, do you remember when we talked in John chapter 14, Jesus said that if they would keep his commandments, that uh, through the keeping his commandments, what would happen? He would come, he and the Father would come, and they would make their abode with us, all right? And in other words, they would, in a, in a practical sense, they would become real. They would manifest themselves. The Father and the Son would manifest themselves to us. And we talked about last time how to have God become real in your life. And it is through what we call abiding in Christ. And that's what we're talking about today. The issue of abiding in Christ. Now, I know the title of the message is, What Kind of a Believer Are You?, and uh, what we see in our text today is we see four kinds of believers. Now, most people say there's only three believers in the passage here. I disagree with that because, well, I've got biblical reasons to disagree with that. And so we're going to look into this, and we see four kinds of Christians in the text. And I got a hint for you today. 
If we cooperate with God, we will end up being the fourth kind of Christian. And that the fourth kind of Christian is the kind of Christian God wants every Christian to be. Every Christian. Now, unfortunately, most Christians don't make a lifestyle of that fourth type of Christian. We'll get there as we go through the text this morning. Now let's open up our Bibles. John chapter 15, verse 1. Jesus says this, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman, or the gardener, okay? Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Get the picture. Jesus is the vine. We are the branches. The Father is the gardener, all right? Jesus is the vine. We are the branches. The Father is the gardener. Now, you see the first kind of Christian is referred to in verse 2. And Jesus says, every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. He taketh away. Number one, there is the believer who does not bear fruit. Now, Listen, what I have just said goes against probably 85% of what most preachers believe today. Because most preachers believe that if you're a Christian, you are going to bear fruit. But what do you do with verse 2? It says, every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. Well, I've heard some say, well, these are, these are bogus believers. These are not real believers. Because if you're a real believer, you will bear fruit. But Jesus says there are some Christians who won't bear fruit, okay? Now, why do I believe these are true believers? Well, two reasons. Number one, the first reason I find in verse two, because he says, every branch where? In me. If you're in Christ, you are saved. If you're in Christ, you are saved. The second reason is found in verse 3. He says that he said, now you are clean. Now, I'm jumping ahead of myself there, but the word now means now already, even now you are clean. Remember, who is he talking to? He's talking to his disciples. He's talking to his inner core. Of course, Judas is gone. Judas Iscariot is gone at this point. But there's no question, okay? Uh, no matter what the Lord does in the life of these believers, getting to those who don't bear fruit, no matter what he does in the life of these believers, they won't obey. Have you ever seen a Christian like that? That's a bad way to live life, folks, to be a rebel child of God. Not all children of God are obedient, just like not all natural children are obedient. There are some who are just rebels, all right, who will not obey, who will not do what their parents ask them to do. And they get disciplined, they get, they get spanked, and, and they go through all kinds of situations, and they are just, for lack of a better term, they're, they're rebels. They're rebels, okay? Now, what does God say to his rebellious children? He says, well, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. What does he do? He takes them away. Now, the word uh, the, where it says taketh away. It, it can mean to take up or away. It can mean to raise. Some say, well, well, here they don't bear fruit. And what he does, he picks them up. He, pick, he picks them up. Okay. I don't think it's referring to that. I think I just take it literally uh, what it's saying here. I want you to hold your place and look at John chapter 19. And here's why I believe that these are real Christians. And uh, what, what is it referring to taking them away? Well, here's what I think. When we talk about taking them away, here's what I think it's referring to, folks. I think it's referring to God takes them out, to put it into modern vernacular. God takes them out. What do you mean? In other words, they, uh, the epistles, excuse me, at, at the end of the uh, New Testament, uh, talk about the sin unto death the sin unto death. I believe a point comes in the life of these Christians. God is faithful. God is patient. But the point comes in the life of these believers who will not follow the Lord, who will not obey the Lord, that God says, enough. And what does he do? He takes them home. He takes them home. All right? Now listen, that's not a good thing. I say, what do you mean it's not a good thing? They go to heaven. Yeah, but they go to heaven with a red face, if you know what I mean. Folks, listen, hopefully I'm not speaking to any of us here today, 
But if you're a believer and you have got your heels dug in as far as not obeying God, maybe you're, a, you're a, a, an adult, maybe you're a teenager. You're just saying, I am not going to conform my life to the word of God. I am not going to follow the Lord, even though you're a son or a daughter. I am not going to do what I know I'm supposed to do. God says, you know what? There can come a day in your life when I'm going to say enough and I'm going to take you out. I'm going to take you out. Now, I've got some scripture to show you this morning, but the first thing I want you to see is this word about every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. In John chapter 19, verse 38, it says, And after this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. Same Greek word, take away. That he might take away the body of Jesus. He didn't just mean lift it up. He meant what? To take it away. Same exact Greek word. So it can certainly mean, and I believe it does mean, I think I just read John chapter 15, verse 2, as it is, every branch in me he taketh away. That doesn't bear fruit. He takes away. Also, look with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. The Corinthian saints, and they were saints, they were believers. Paul made that very clear in 1 Corinthians 1, verses 1 and 2. He said, to all the saints at Corinth. Well, you're not a, biblically, you're not a saint unless you've put your faith in Christ. And if you've put your faith in Christ, you are a saint. You've been sanctified. That's what the word saint, holy, hagias, pure, sanctify, all the same root word there. Now, a person who's put their faith in Christ is a saint. And the word of God, though, tells us that the Corinthian church, while they were believers, they were what we call carnal. Carnal means fleshly. They live their life not according to their new spirit man. They live their life according to the old man, according to the flesh nature that we're all born with. And by the way, even if you're saved, that you still possess. Because when we sin, it's our flesh that sins because our new man cannot commit sin at all because it's born of God. And so the Corinthians, they had a lot of problems in their church. And one of the problems they had in their church was that they were coming to the Lord's Supper, one of the two ordinances God has left us with in the body. And they were coming to the Lord's Supper. And some of them were coming in a very irreverent way. As a matter of fact, even some of them were coming drunk. These were Christians, okay? And they were not very respectful when it came to the Lord's Supper. And Paul said something very interesting to these Christians, he said in 1 Corinthians eleven thirty, 30, For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many, what? Sleep. Now that doesn't mean they had a, uh, a sleep number bed or a tempur okay, or a water bed or whatever. What does it mean? It means that God had taken them out. Because of their rebellion, because of their refusal to obey God, he took them out of this world. Where did he take them? They didn't go to hell. They're saved. They went to heaven, but they went to heaven prematurely. They went to heaven before God would have. You see, God has a perfect will for us, and then he has a permissive will. He allowed them to live in rebellion. Of course, he chastened them. He worked with them. And I think, isn't it interesting, for this cause many are weak and sickly. Those are the ones he was chastening. They were weak and sickly. They were under his discipline, but there were also some who wouldn't wake up spiritually in a sense. And so what happened? He took them to heaven. Now, this can certainly apply to the believer who quits bearing fruit as well, who backslides, who at one point was on fire for Christ, who was excited about the things of God. They were bearing fruit. They were, they were a living, their life as a Christian was a living example of what Jesus Christ can do in the life of a healthy Christian. Now go back to John chapter 15. Some people quit bearing fruit. Some Christians refuse to bear fruit. You might say, that just sounds crazy. I think in most cases, it's a case of a person who ends up quitting they stop bearing fruit, okay? They don't bear fruit. They don't bear fruit. By the way, so much for the doctrine of perseverance. That teaches if you're saved, you're going to live a godly life and, and you're going to endure to the end of your life and, and uh, be faithful all the days of your life or most of your life anyway and all that. No, friends, it just doesn't hold up in Scripture. You know, I wish it was true. Don't you wish it was true? Wouldn't the body of Christ be a lot better? Wouldn't we be a lot more effective if when you got saved, God took away your free will and made you and just kind of put you on the, on the conveyor belt of Christian success? 
And, you know, oh, well, you know what? I, I, I used to struggle with that. Now that I'm saved, no more struggles about anything. I just live a victorious Christian life every day. Praise God. Well, that'd be great. But you know that's not the way it is. Because when you get saved, not only did you have the freedom to accept Christ as your Savior, but when you get saved, you have the freedom to serve Him. And that's what we ought to do. And that's God's will. But not every Christian does the will of God. And so here we have believers who don't bear fruit. And what does he say? He says, every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. He taketh away. But now let's look at the next part of verse 2. It says, and every branch in me that beareth fruit, he purges it, purgeth it, or prunes it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Number two, we see the Christian who bears fruit. Now, this is an interesting one, folks, and we're going to spend a little time on this one because I believe this is one of the issues of the Christian life that a lot of Christians struggle with and they don't get. And if we don't get this, there's going to be a temptation in our lives as Christians now to where even if we're serving Christ and even if we have a heart for God and all, that when He brings hardships into our lives, there's the temptation, instead of getting better, we end up getting bitter. Instead of getting better, we end up getting bitter. This is the Christian life that is so challenging to our thinking. This believer is being obedient. This believer is bearing fruit. This believer is being used of God. In other words, they're not resisting the Lord. They're serving the Lord. They're bearing fruit. They're being fruitful. But then what happens? The Lord puts, puts him or her through the fire. He purges it in the gardener terms. He prunes it. He cuts it back. Think about it. What if a branch could talk? Imagine what you would hear if you cut some of it off. You know what? It's the same in a Christian life. You can write it down, folks. Listen, purging is painful. Purging is painful. We're not talking about rebel Christians here. We are talking about Christians who are serving Christ. That's what verse 2, that second Christian, is talking about. Hold your place here and look with me over to James chapter 1. James chapter 1. One of those passages of scriptures we don't like reading when we are under trial, when we are going through a hardship in life. James 1 verse 2. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations or various trials. Boy, that's not easy, is it? That's tough. Count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience or perseverance, endurance. But let patience have her perfect work. You notice that. Let patience have her perfect work. Yield to God. Allow Him to do it. Cooperate with Him. Be humble through it. Let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect or, or mature and entire, wanting or lacking nothing. In other words, it's through the purging, even though we're living for Christ. Something, listen, you're living for Christ and you're yielded and you're submitted to Him and you're, and you're having your devotions and your prayer time and you're trying to raise your kids right and you're being a good employee at work and all of a sudden, the bottom falls out and it's like, Lord, what's going on here? I'm serving you. I'm serving you. And if he would answer back, he says, you are. Yes. And I'm pleased. But you know what? I'm cutting you back here. I'm purging. I'm pruning. And I know it's painful. You're getting cut. Okay. But I have a purpose. The purpose is greater fruitfulness. But to get there, you have to get cut back first. You have to get pruned. You have to get purged. 2 Corinthians 12, 9. Paul, of course, thorn in the flesh. He went to the Lord three times with it. Did the Lord take it away? No. Let me ask you folks, was Paul serving Christ? Oh, he was a great man of God. He was a, he was a giant of the faith. He was a spiritual man. He was a godly man. And yet God sent him a thorn in the flesh. And he says in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, because he besought the Lord three times, and the Lord didn't take it away, but the Lord said unto him, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength, Paul says, my strength is made perfect, or God's strength is made perfect in weakness. 
Most gladly, Paul says, therefore will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities. That sounds just like James, doesn't it? Count it all joy. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Folks, God, even when we're serving Christ, there are times of life where the Lord comes in and he's got his hedge clippers and he's got his scissors. And he says, you know what? This is going to be painful. But if you don't go through this, you will not accomplish what I want you to accomplish down the road. That's tough. That's hard. That's hard Christian living right there. That's hard stuff. It may be a terrible disease. It may be a terrible financial thing that happens. It may be a, a terrible thing that just shocks you. Lord, what are you doing? Lord, I'm being faithful. He says, you need to go through this. See, the Lord wants us to come to the place where we understand that our only deliverance in this life is his grace. Because it is only by his grace that we will ever truly amount to anything that will last for him. Dr. Warren Wiersbe writes, the vine dresser prunes the branches in two ways. Listen, folks. He cuts away dead wood that can breed disease and insects, and he cuts away living tissue so that the life of the vine will not be so dissipated that the quality of the crop will be jeopardized. In fact, the vine dresser will even cut away whole bunches of grapes so that the rest of the crop will be of higher quality. Do you hear me this morning? He continues, God wants both quantity and quality. This pruning process is the most important part of the whole enterprise. And the people who do it must be carefully trained or they can destroy an entire crop. Some vineyards invest two or three years in the training of the pruners so they know where to cut, how much to cut, and even at what angle to cut. And guess what? The Father is the master pruner of Christian individually and of churches collectively. Do we get it? Do we get it? Are we listening today? So there is the Christian who bears fruit, but the Lord says, not done with you. Some pruning needs to take place. Oh, Lord, it's painful. But we need it, which leads us to our third Christian. There's the Christian who bears more fruit the Christian who bears more fruit. This is the fruit that we bear, but couldn't have borne had we not come to a new level through suffering. It has come through a purging and a purifying reality. That's how you get there, to where you bear more fruit. There are those who don't bear any fruit, takes them out. There are those who are bearing fruit, they're being obedient. What does he do? He prunes. And by the way, folks, if you've been pruned once, it doesn't mean you won't be pruned again. Why? Healthy plants need to be pruned, right? They need to be purged. Then there's the Christian who bears more fruit. And why does he bear more fruit? Because he's been purged. Because he's cooperated with the Lord through that process. This is the fruit, again, that we bear but couldn't have borne had we not come to a new level through suffering. I think of Hebrews 12, 11, where it says, Now no chastening for the present seems to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterwards, afterwards, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Listen, chastening isn't always negative. Chastening is a discipline. It's a training. It isn't always because of sin. Sometimes it is. Many times it is. But not always. Sometimes it's simply the training, the discipline. And it's through that, that fruitfulness comes. Hold your place and look at 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter 5. I can't help but think that this is what Peter was talking about. By the way, 1 Peter written for believers who are suffering. 1 Peter chapter 5 in verse 10. Very interesting how... The scriptures link God's grace being active with the suffering and the pruning and the purging process of the believer. Verse 10, But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus. By the way, that's our end. That's good news, isn't it? 
after that you have suffered a while, make you perfect or complete, establish, strengthen, settle you. There's a process involved here. There's a process. Now let's go back to John chapter 15. I am the true vine, my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit he purges it that it may bring forth more fruit. Verse 3, now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Now you are clean, even now. In other words, these people were saved. He's talking to his disciples, they were saved. I got a question for you this morning. How did they get clean? How did they get clean? By trusting Christ as their savior. In Revelation chapter one, verse five, it says, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission, there's no forgiveness. It is through what Christ did on the cross, okay? Can I show you this this morning? Maybe you've never seen this before, if this hand represents you and me and my wallet represents our sin. We are sinners. We are dirty with sin. God says our sin must be paid for. We're sinners. We fall short of the glory of God. To get to heaven, you have to be sinless in God's eyes. We are not. God says our sin must be paid for. And if I'm going to pay for my sin, I'll have to spend forever separated from God in hell. Same with you. The wages of sin is death. Now, most people think you get rid of your sin through good works, but good works will not get rid of sin. They cover it. They make us look better. It's good to be good, okay? If the pages of my Bible was a life of good works, I can put that on there and I say, oh boy, look at all those good works. Yes, but the sin has to be gone for me to get to heaven. It has to be gone. How am I going to do this? What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Because there's nothing I could do to save myself, God sent his son. And when Jesus died on the cross, he took my sin upon himself and he shed his blood as the full payment for sin, past, present, and future. All my sin. And he came back from the dead, and he offers us, folks, as a free gift, eternal life. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. When you trust Christ as your Savior, you put your faith in him. He gives you, as a gift, everlasting life. It's a gift. It's not a contract. It's a gift. It's free to anyone who would put their trust in him as their Savior he will give them eternal life. What did Jesus say in John chapter 6, verse 47? He said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath, possesses now, everlasting life. You mean all I need to do is to trust in him as the one who died for my sins and paid for them and rose again? Yes, yes. And he'll give you salvation as a gift. That's good news. That's real good news. Now in John chapter 15 and verse 4, Jesus says to his disciples in verse 3, you're already clean through the word which I've spoken unto you. He says, you're already saved. You're saved. You're clean. Okay, then where do we go from there? Well, verse 4, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. See, true fruit bearing as a Christian comes through abiding in Christ. The word abide here is the word mino, okay? It means to stay in a given place, to remain in a place. Where is the place God has called us to remain, okay? Let me put it this way, simply put. To abide in Christ is to walk in fellowship and obedience to him. It means to stay in that given place, to stay in fellowship with him, to stay close to him. When we sin, we confess our sin. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sin, cleanse us from all unrighteousness, and we can continue walking close to the Lord in that sweet fellowship, that common bond, that joint participation. But we are to walk in fellowship with him. To abide is the idea, stay abiding. Stay abiding in him. And as we stay abiding in him and staying close to him and walking in fellowship with him, not letting the things of this world or the things of the flesh get between us, as we're staying close to him and abiding, what happens? We will start bearing fruit. Our lives will start bearing fruit. I have people ask, what is the fruit he's referring to? Some say it's souls. It could be that. It's the fruit of the spirit. It could be that. Folks, it's all the things that Jesus wants to produce through our lives. Why do we have to limit it to this or that? He didn't. He didn't. 
but it's what God will produce through our fellowship with him and through our obedience to his word. And it's God's will that we would be fruitful. By the way, this all is the lesson of purging, isn't it? Because what does purging drive us to? An abiding lifestyle, doesn't it? That's what it drives us to. See, we can, be, we can get lazy as Christians and we can start relaxing too much in a Christian life. We become lazy. We become passive. We're not serving as we should. We just get in a Christian rut of life. We just going through the motions and all of a sudden the Lord comes in with his clippers. We start going, ah, oh, this is painful. Lord, oh, this hurts, Lord. And we weren't doing bad things. We were doing right things, but we were getting mechanical. And what does it do? It drives us to him. Oh, Lord, I need thee every hour. Oh, Lord, you start spending hours in the scriptures and your life starts becoming more revitalized as a Christian. And as we get more revitalized as a Christian, we start seeing things the way we should. And we maybe start realizing, you know what? I didn't even know I drifted that far. But Lord, I'm back and I'm enjoying a sweet fellowship. And you know what starts happening? You get more serious minded as a Christian and you start bearing fruit. You start bearing fruit. Why? Because through purging, he brought you to a place of abiding. Wow, what a place to be. By the way, that's one reason we can count it all joy, because that's what God does. To abide in Christ is to walk in fellowship and obedience to him. By the way, that's brought out. We're not covering it this week, but in verse 9, as the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. The word continue there is abide. How? How do we abide? By keeping his word, trusting him by grace. We trust him for grace. He gives us grace He's kind and he, through grace, provides us the power to live the Christian life. Back to John 15 and verse 5, Jesus says, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. Look at this next part. For without me, ye can do nothing. By the way, folks, that does not mean that we can't mimic the Christian life, okay? Do we understand that we can do Christian things in the flesh? You ever hear some Christians pray? Have you ever listened to what you pray? Have you ever analyzed? Am I just saying this because I'm supposed to? You're praying in the flesh. Without Christ, we can do nothing. And the only way we have him working on our behalf is when we abide in him. We stay in fellowship with him and walk in obedience, humble obedience to him. We are close and we're walking day and day, okay? Every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before, the great song, okay? We are to abide in him, walk hand in hand with the Lord each day. And as we do, we are going to start manifesting fruit. God is going to produce fruit through our lives. It's the result of abiding. Fruitfulness is the result of abiding. That's what Jesus says here. Abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of its self accepted abide in the vine no more can ye except ye abide in me i'm the vine you're the branches he that abides in me and i in him the same bringeth forth much fruit by the way that's the fourth kind of christian and that's what god's will is for every christian the christian who bears not fruit not some fruit not more fruit but much fruit and how does it happen by abiding in christ I could not help but think of Psalm 1. Look at these scriptures. Psalm 1, verses 1 through 3. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. Because if you're walking in the counsel of the ungodly, you're not abiding in Christ. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, the scoffers, okay? Do you know any Christians who scoff at the word of God? Don't hang around with them, folks. That stuff is contagious. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. There's somebody who's abiding. And what's going to be the result of that? He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, mark that word, and whatsoever he doeth, shall prosper. Whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Look at back to John 15. Look at verse 6. Jesus says, if a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire and they're burned. Ah, ah, see there, there. If you don't live for Christ, you're going to go to hell. Now it's not talking about going to hell. That's out of context. The word withered here, it means to shrivel or to dry up. 
Have you ever seen any dried up Christians? I have. What is this? Why is he withered? Because he is out of fellowship with the vine. He's cutting himself off through rebellion. The result of a person who does not abide in Christ is that they will come into difficult times in life. It could be the fiery chastening of God, or it could be the simple fact of a destroyed life through the law of reaping and sowing. Galatians 6, 7, Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. He who sows to his flesh, love the flesh, reap corruption, rottenness. He who sows to the Spirit shall reap life everlasting. God says if we don't abide in Christ, we're going to be cast forth as a branch and we are going to become withered in our Christian life. Our Christian lives are going to shrivel up. They're going to dry up, folks. And you know, if we stay on that path, what's going to happen? Our lives will be like you taking those shriveled up things and you just throw them into the, into the fire. They're, they're waste. And it ends up in ruin. A lot of Christians' lives end up in ruin. Why? It didn't have to be that way. John 15, 7, if you abide in me... And my words abide in you. Isn't it interesting, the link between the word of God and, the, and the, the God of the word? Jesus, the living word. Scripture, the written word. If ye abide in me and my words abide in you, that's what you need to abide in him. Ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. And by the way, that qualifies you as being a true disciple of Christ. Look what he said. So shall ye be my disciples. A disciple is not not just a saved person. In Jesus' mind here in the context, a disciple is one who's not only saved, but somebody who's bearing much fruit. Two friends were talking of the family of a prominent man who had just died. Quote, his oldest son was the source of great joy to him, unquote, one of them said. Quote, he brought great distinction upon the family name, unquote. And what of the other two? Oh, they were well enough. That is, they never did anything to disgrace their father. Still, they never glorified his name. If it depended upon them, the name would perish with them. There are Christians of whom something like this must be said. They have never done anything to disgrace the name they wear, but they have certainly not added to its influence and its power. They just going through life, going through life. Oh, occasionally there's a little fruit, little fruit, little fruit. But you know what? They're not bearing much fruit. They're not glorifying the name of the Father. Folks, God has called us to bring glory to his name. How? By bearing much fruit. How do you bear much fruit? By abiding in Christ. How do you abide in Christ? By walking in close fellowship daily with him and obeying his word, obeying his his word. And God promises to you and me that we will bear much fruit, okay? That we will bear much fruit. We're going to close over in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. You could possibly be here today, and maybe you're not even connected to the vine yet. Maybe you've never trusted Christ as your Savior. You may be religious. You may be trying to live a good life. But you know what, friend? You don't go to heaven by living a good life because we could never be good enough. The only way you go to heaven is by putting your trust in Jesus Christ. Not trusting yourself, okay? Here's the way we are. If my Bible's Jesus Christ, okay, here's the way we are. Most people are trusting in themselves, their good works, their performance, the way they live. They're trying to live a godly life, be a good person, all this, and that's what they're trusting in. To some extent, they're trusting in themselves. God says, if you want salvation, if you you want to go to heaven, you have to not trust in yourself, but you have to take your trust and you need to place it in Christ. Trust in Him as your Savior. That's the only way of salvation. You cannot be saved another way. The Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Trust him if you've never done that today. Would you do that? Then you can have the privilege of abiding and bearing fruit. But bearing fruit, trying to bear fruit, will not save you. Okay? Salvation is a gift. You need to trust Christ for that. Well, friends, that concludes this edition of Voice of Assurance. Thanks so much for listening, and would you share this ministry with a friend? 
To contact us or learn more about our ministry, please visit www.northlandchurch.com. Your prayers and support for this ministry are greatly appreciated. Thank you so much, and God bless you.